Hi there, poetry freaks, and welcome to Bush Slam. This is the show that puts poets and poetry in motion across Australia. I'm H.G. Nelson at the wheel of the Slam Dual Cab V8 Ute, hooning about with an ear out for rhymes on the run. And this week, the Ute pulls into a town that has almost come to a complete standstill. This week, Bush Slam is camped in Blinman, population 25. But 100 years ago, there were 1,500 hardy souls digging for a fortune. History hovers about the joint, plenty for today's poets to sink their teeth into. And then the tricky bit, after three days of working on their verse, they have to perform their poem before the remaining residents of the joint for a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So let's take the tools out the back of the ute and meet this week's Diggers in the Dirt. I'm John Kinsella. I'm a poet and environmental activist. I'm known primarily as a landscape poet and I've lived in, you know, very interesting parts of the world. So I write comparatively about those different places. And I write about a 20 square mile region of the Western Australian wheat belt. And I look at that area very intensely, very close up. They've been warned on every farm that playing in the silos would lead to death. You sink in wheat, slowly. And the more you struggle, the worse it gets. You'll see a rat sail past your face, nimble on its turf, and then you'll disappear. And there, hard work has no reward. My name's Alison Crogan, and I'm a poet, but I also write novels. Really, I'm a lyric poet, which means that the poetry I write it all comes from almost imaginary landscape sometimes. I understand the desolation of flowers. My companion, your hands are cruel lilies, grasping for life, whispering of ash and bones. My companion, even you cannot touch my isolation. Smoke darkens the sky, a planet of fires, where each of us warms our bodies. The sky is a crematorium. Well, John, what a fabulous place. You would love this place because you talk a lot in your poems about the force of nature. Yeah, this is the force of nature. Look at this, the water moves through at a very high pace. I mean, it's dry all round, but when the rain comes, it comes and comes down and it gathers together. It beads off the surface and rolls down and just cuts its way through the creek. I like the use of the word beads off the surface. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a line. That's <laughs> going to be in there. <laughs> that's right, that's great. Now, if we can follow down the creek here a bit, I think there's a spectacular moment down here. OK, well, look at this here, John. Uh, force of water collects everything in its path. Yeah, so it's never coming down here, yep. Yeah, never mind whether it's corrugated iron, parrots, galahs or wood, and it just stacks it up on there. I mean, the imagination of how much water, the tons and tons of water, to bend this corrugated iron around this tree. It's fantastic, isn't it? It is, and, and you know, this is supposed to be, this is an arid place. It's like the world in miniature. Everything fits together, it looks chaotic, but it all works together. And uh, even, the, even the tin, which is a kind of a, obviously an alien intrusion in the place, has become part of it. Poetry. Poetry. Stationary. Absolutely. As opposed to in motion. It was in motion, now it's stationary. While John doodles in the red dirt dust, Alison hooks up with publican, Progress Committee president and librarian Maureen Kutry. Originally, Blinman was known as a copper mining town. In the 1860s, it was one of the largest in South Australia. And at that time, we had 2,500 people living here. And you're obviously very proud of this town. We love the place. It's why we chose to live here. It's why many people choose to live here. Well, 25. <laughs> <laughs> if we can say that's many. It has a special feel about the place. It's in the beautiful Flinders Ranges. Yes, it is very beautiful. And it's mm. an historic town that has survived. Is the library new? No, no, actually the, the library has been there since about 1901. Wow. We, um, it did rust out, so oh. we did have a new skin put on it. Well, should we go and have a look at it? Certainly. I'm looking forward to seeing it. This is like the sweetest library I've ever seen. That's a completely gorgeous, isn't it? And you're the librarian? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Among many things, it's easy to be a librarian in Blinman. 
people are very honest. Oh, they just funny. come in and borrow a book and then bring it back when they're finished. <laughs> <laughs> so I just keep the place dusted. Coming up, we've got a Back to Blimmin celebration. A major yeah. part of it is a school reunion. So we've been getting out all bits and pieces of old school work. And as you can see here, we've got some of John Branch's work from 1938, his geometry, so neat. It is. John Branch was a, a, a character in the town. He um, was my children's pseudo-grandpa, and I think he was pseudo-grandpa to everybody. And he died a few years ago, so. Okay. Um, you've still got his school We've still got his school work. Oh, well, John, uh, look, here we are in the countryside about Blimmin. We've got the Great Wall of China behind us. A spectacular backdrop. It must give you plenty to think about sinking the teeth into. If I could have life the way I wanted it, I'd be out here naming the animals and the plants, learning about them, that kind of thing, you know, the dirt. As we come up this hill here, we get the reverse effect, this huge vastness of the country. Isn't it around. incredible? I mean, look at this. It, reduces you to the correct size, <laughs> it, it, if it, I can it put it, it that way. Uh, well, Alison, is this, is this a place that you can draw inspiration from for your big verse? Well, what I've been thinking about is, is how this became a place. I mean, this is a town. Yeah. How, how did it become that? What was the... What were the things that made people decide this was a home? So it's, I'm sort of imagining it's like little tiny things. Yeah, like what? Well, shall I just read a couple of lines? Yeah. A man rides through an ochre valley, cursing the flies. He knows none of the old names and the new have yet to be invented. His sweating horse stumbles on gray river stones. The dust swarms into his nostrils. For me, good poetry is actually about a, a kind of genuine connection between the language that you use and what you're writing about. Usually the way I work anyway is I work in a notebook, I'm very much an outside per outdoors person, uh, my notebook is a field journal, I record everything I see and a poem distills out of that often. But my main interest in being here is, is the physical environment. Well, John, I'm right out of my comfort zone, but you're not, are you? I'm not. I'm really no. comfortable. This is great. As soon as we, this is how you work. Yeah, this yeah. As soon as we hit that road yeah. going out of uh, Port Augusta and we got up into the bush, I was happy. I reckon, though, you know, being out of your comfort zone will actually produce something really, really interesting because it's when you get that tension, that disjunction between your yeah. normal working method. Oh, and, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's really yeah. important to have those moments of, you know, stimulus, if you like, or whatever, mm. or trigger moments, you know, yeah. where you start going off in another direction and yeah. so on. Um, the only problem is it usually takes me months from the trigger moment uh -huh. to the uh, You haven't got months this time. <laughs> You've got to get it out there I tomorrow know. evening. Alison leaves the Blinman Big Smoke behind and gets her boots dusty at the sight of the once thriving copper mine. Well, inevitably, I think about my father, who is a Cornish miner. But he spent a lot of his life in mines and took me down mines when I was a kid. And so it's not exactly a kind of foreign environment to me. So there's all those, I suppose, emotional resonances. And then um, it's just so fascinating, all the remains of um, what people have laboured to make these great big holes in the ground. It's kind of, in its own way, really quite beautiful. The town hopes that this hole in the ground is the key to Blinman's survival, this time as a tourist attraction. The copper was discovered in 1859 by a, a shepherd called Robert Pegleg Blinman. Robert Pegleg, eh? Yes, he had yeah. a pegleg. And, and he uh, wouldn't happen to be person the town was named after. That is oh, the very okay. same and he was canny enough to know what he'd discovered when he came across the oh, copper okay. outcrop and he took up the mineral lease. And then sold it And on. then sold it in, in 1862 to a company called the Yudnamutna Mining Company. <laughs> the Yudnamutna. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's a local Aboriginal word oh, that's okay. slightly anglicised and that was actually a group of investors in England. Right. Yes. So was there, were there many accidents in this mine? There were some, some deaths for yeah. sure. There's uh, one fella buried in the Blimmin Cemetery and uh, his gravestone reads that he was killed by an uh, explosion of gunpowder. 
my father worked on the mines up in uh, Port Hedland and uh, Dampier and around there. My um, great-grandfather was the uh, foreman of the South Champion gold mine in Kukaini. He died of miners' isis, as they say, dust on the lungs. So I kind of have a, a sense of mining places, and that's certainly in my mind when I think of Blinman. When I came down here in the afternoon, directly opposite the cemetery, a willy willy started, and it raced across the road into the cemetery as I was approaching and kind of funneled its way through, like, you know, drawing the, the spirits, if you like, up. It was that, that was a really um, visceral image. Above was a large wedge-tailed eagle as well. And I've got an image in this poem, the eagle being on the thermal of the, of the you know, of the dead. So I'm interested in how you define things and how uh, on the edge things become different. An edge doesn't mean something disappears on the other side, it just means it changes and that change can be a good thing. So I don't know if it's going to be called edges, but that's certainly the way I've been thinking. Oh gosh, I see where we are. Part of the... So we're at the bottom of that thing I was looking at. Yes, that's right. Yeah. When you were at the top looking down. This is yeah, a mighty hole in the ground that people made. Um, you know, it's not a natural phenomenon. It's, it's a, a scar in the earth that was made with enormous, you know, they, they, there's chisel marks in the walls here, which, which were made by all the miners who came through here and the explosives they paid with their lives sometimes to make these holes. It's kind of a staggering thought that people could, you know, manage to do these things, be so patient in a way and determined that's kind of admirable in a strange way. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you can't write anywhere in this land without acknowledging the traditional owners. I have to negotiate that issue to um, really feel comfortable about, about doing anything uh, in, a, in a writing sense. Yeah, the group of my people are called the Adamutna tribe, and uh, like we range throughout the Flinders Ranges, um, learn to live and respect what we had here. How do you feel about someone like me coming in and kind of writing poetry about it, basically? Is that something that you think's okay? I, I think it's okay to come in and write poetry about the land and stuff like that, but, you know, just leave aside the uh, cultural yeah, yeah. side of things. Well, I think you can talk about that respectfully. Yeah. It's like everything else, um, and, but unless you are respectful and conscious and kind of talk to people about what you're doing, you can't, you know, you can just come across the wrong, wrong way, and I don't want yeah. to. We love to see visitors come to our country to, uh, you know, not only spend money, but to have a look at it and, you know, respect what we got. Yeah, and that's it, isn't it? It is yeah. about respect. It's an issue of right. respect. Well, John, here we are with the poet's tools spread out on the uh, Blinman store uh, front porch on the table here. We've got the Portable typewriter. Portable manual typewriter. Portable. That's the trick, yeah. Right. Why the typewriter? Well, I, I really think that writing poems, uh, I always write in note form first, but then I transfer onto a manual typewriter because of the pace. When I start, it starts off and it says the word arid is relative to what grows in dry places, what thrives in its dirt, its stone, its air. Now that has a very set kind of rhythm, and it's very much the rhythm of the typewriter. If you listen, um, I'm just the word, and then I've got arid. But when you get the rhythm, it really does reflect in, in the words themselves. You know, I really don't think a poem's ever finished either. It might be that later I go through and rework it and some of that other information I didn't use comes in. Well, we've got something really interesting here, which is some old photographs of Blit Blinman. And they're really very beautiful photographs too. You can see the people who lived here and and this amazing photograph of the copper mine um, when it was working. There's something really melancholy about them. That, uh, you know, things that were once busy making, producing, and now abandoned in this actually incredible landscape. I mean, it, it is really, um, it prompts a lot of feeling, actually, and thought.
John is streaking ahead, transferring the poem's drafts from the handwritten sketches to his dirt-free laptop. Oh, pretty close. Um, this is the uh, one of the roughs from the typewriter. I did a few. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a few notes on it. And what I'm doing is keeping the basic structure of this and working my notes, no, my last minute notes, into the hole. So it's been through, I guess, this would be about probably the sixth draft mm -hmm. in the last couple of days. How different is each draft? First to the sixth, greatly, yeah. but fifth to the sixth, not much. Right. So they're like, you know, a couple of notes here and there, they get worked in line, gets rewritten, that kind of thing. Like the first stanza has eight lines, second stanza has nine lines, third, ten. Right. So it's growing, it's building, much mm -hmm. like town, I guess. Ah, very good. Uh, just as well there's not a hundred stanzas. <laughs> well, yeah, that'd be scary. Well, this is Beltana, which is, um, or has been said to us, if Blinman doesn't sort of pick up its game, it could end up like Beltana. And Beltana's effectively a ghost town. It was a telegraph farm station. It was obviously built with uh, the idea that people would stay here. They've made these beautiful stone buildings, some of which are still in very good nick and some of which are just ruined walls. I was, I was looking at some old photographs of uh, when it was full of people. There's a, a photograph of a, a veranda just stuffed with all these people. It looks like a wedding or something and they're all dressed up and they're out for a picnic. And um, which is hard to imagine being here now, really. You, all that's left are little traces, you know, things you find on the earth or the houses they built, but the feeling that they're going to be just exposed to the sun and crumble away. It's very strong here. The sense of mortality and fragility of, of human endeavor is very strong here. Well, Alison, on the wall here is a photo of the founder of Blinman, the That's man right. who gave his name to the town. Indeed, mm. and he has got into the poem. Ah, great. Yes, so there's right. something fascinating about that family portrait, isn't there? No, they all look as though they'd rather be anywhere else but Blinman. <laughs> Good. Now, the things that we've seen around Blinman, yes. uh, how much have you been able to tip into your bucket here? I think because I came here with a totally blank slate, like, with no idea what I was going to write and how I was going to write it. So I've just been sort of sponge-like drifting around, seeing what's here, and that's what I've been working with. As I said, it's unusual for me to write a poem in this way, and I think I've written a well-written poem. Our slammers are so far ahead of the curve, they're downing tools for an afternoon of high-quality Flinders Rangers cricket. Yeah, so how are you going, Ben? I'm John. How are you going, mate? Yeah, they tell me you're a poet around here. And oh, well, let's have a listen. In a little town above a valley, they play a game with a laugh. It's hard, it's real, and it's them. They play for keeps and for fun. That's why they have a trophy every week called the Knacker. A young bloke came to lift the side, always handy with a bat and could bowl a bloody good Yorker. How, how many people are actually playing here, do you think? Well, you've got your um, team of 11, 12th man, and the other team's got... Same number. And sometimes they don't quite make up the team and they might have to both share a 12th man or a fielder or two, but right. but it does take the whole town. Yeah. Right. Yay! Yeah! Welcome to Blinman for Bush Slam! And thanks very much to the town of Blinman. And we'd like to now ask you, Blinman, to get them out and bang them and bang them until they bleed as you welcome to the microphone contestant number one, the woman in the black top, Alison Crogan! My poem's called Blinman. Hunched over his schoolwork, a boy slowly pushes his pencil along the page, carefully noting the length of the line in copper plate. It is 1938. On the far side of the world, where everything happens, Europe bristles for war. He is thinking that when he's finished his homework, he will go rabbiting out where the Warrens scar the Red Hills white. 
That shepherd who saw how the naked rock was stained green with his fortune, who gave the town his name, stares out of the sepia past, his face as hard as the slag vomited out of the smelter. For £40,000, he sold the hills and the town sprang like a beast, clawing old names into new usage. Copper was the brilliant lure, calling wagons and men who chiseled the rock by hand, hacking cathedrals out of the dark. Their god was money. They worshipped hard and paid the blood price, sending a tithe of broken bodies down to the graveyard. That's how a town becomes more than a place when the land speaks of the dead to the living. That's when the chains tightened. Yet chains rust, houses sag and crumble to ruins on desolate hillsides. And even ghosts can die, evaporating from flaking stone, visited only by the echoes of emus and starlight. But a stubborn pulse beats still in the heart of Blinman. Nobody knows when it begins when you stop owning the land because it owns you. Grain by grain, its sediment fills your veins. The shadows and shames of yours, the colours of sunset over the darkening ranges, the soft purple and green of native pines and oaks. And ghosts wander here still, on moonlit nights to the graveyard, past the banners of pepper trees, their eyes solemn and empty, their faces shining with the many names of stars. Alison Crogan there, ladies and gentlemen, capturing a Blinman that I'm sure many of you know very, very well. She's thrown down a gauntlet here in the main street of Blinman in front of the pub. And now to see if he's up to taking on the challenge, the man in black, Mr John Kinsella. This is called Edges of Aridity. The word arid is relative to what grows in dry places, what thrives in its dirt, its stone, its air. When water flows here, it flows fast. The rain beads on the surface, grows together and rushes. A river red gum catches the detritus, braces the collapse, the lost, the leftovers. In its upper branches, pink and grey galahs eye the deep and promising hollows. When native pines were eaten by the mine's furnaces, edges shifted. As sheep found the shade of Kasha, the waiter wild bush, the edges shifted. A town builds out of its gatherings. It's its edges. Moments even out between the hills high above sea level and heat is the thin edge of a conversation. Emus and kangaroos shape the dry air. The movements of ants are the movements of mountains and cicadas wait for the sun to set to name the night's arrival. The edge of town is near its centre. Pepper trees complicate the shade, which is always a pleasure. Rabbits on bare slopes of evening kick dust as dry place smoke. Out of this, the cemetery is an edge I know. It speaks to all places of the dead, inside and out. Quartzite, slate and marble hold the dead down in the copper ground. But they break through constantly. A whirly-whirly, vigorous, determined, crosses the road. A strong funnel lifting the scarce pickings of dry ground concentrating. It crosses into the cemetery and connects ground and sky, a spiral nebula of the dead, a whirlpool of the arid as the wedge tails catch their thermals and a rabbit just out of range of the spiral digs at the grave before stopping short of farmers, miners and the priest, men, women and children. The edges of space full of sunlight, full of unmarked and unknown graves, reaching out over the fence lines, living with the living, part of country. Tin flowers, headstones, bled of scripts, a fence spread or a mine opening. The woodwork splintering in simulacra or real time. Edges are beginnings, not ends. I have seen the silhouettes of backlit ranges, the cracked edges of stars, the living places of the dead, the cut lines of flow, the edges of thermals and limestone and slag heaps, the needles of acacias and their sea pods opening, hoping new growth will join the old and know these edges are beginnings, not ends. I have heard the tawny frogmouth just out of reach of the town's lights and seen shadows move out from headstones, alive, edgy and stable, moving out over rock and fault line, lifting up from below ground, flowing rich with aridity. Thanks. Yes, and John's only been here three days. Imagine what he'd do in three weeks, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So now the tricky bit, of course, is uh, you have to make up your minds which poem you think captures the Blinman that you know and live in. Can I ask the poets to join me in the squared circle once again, ladies and gentlemen? 
we've got Alison Crogan and John Kinsella now, as you welcome them back. <laughs> Tremendous work. And so, in the order of appearance, can I ask you if you thought Alison's poem was the better to go silly with the light right now? <laughs> or, on the other hand, if you thought John Kinsella's nailed the place better than Alison's, go crazy with the light now! <laughs> well, Blinman, you make it very, very difficult. The best I can do is declare here in Blinman on Bush Slam a dead heat! <laughs> Yeah, I like John's poem, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Explained a fair bit about the country around the area. Yeah, I liked the guys better. I thought he did a really good job and showed the emotion that, from the country. Yeah, I liked hers, I thought it was absolutely excellent. I thought uh, she didn't spend quite as long in the cemetery. I like the bloke in the black the way he came across, but having said that, I thought they were all a bit more. I was glad it was yeah. a dead hair because yeah. I thought they both captured Blinman, but in different ways. 